It's my distinct pleasure tonight to introduce a man that has caught more games for the Phillies than any other catcher in the history of the, of the Phillies. It's with my great honor to introduce the latest inductee to the Wall of Fame for the Phillies, Mike Lieberthal. All right, hello and welcome to Double Play Sports. I'm James alongside Pat. Welcome to episode 44 of our podcast. We're joined today by former Phillies catcher, Phillies Wall of Fame member, two-time All-Star and Gold Glove winner, Mike Lieberthal. Mike, how's it going today? It's going good. Just waking up over here on the West Coast. (laughs) Yeah, it seems like uh, it should be nice and sunny. How's the weather out there? Because it's pretty cold here in Philly. Pretty bad. Uh, Well, it was raining. It's been raining the last few days here, but... I've been in uh, Tampa, Florida, which was actually pretty cold. So to come back here to rain is kind of a little weird being in L.A., which never rains, but a little wet outside. Um, but want to start off the interview with a little question about um, your upbringing. So your dad, when I was doing my research, found out he was an MLB scout for the Giants and the Tigers. What was it like growing up with a professional with professional baseball kind of surrounding you? Um, yeah, he started scouting when I was probably – maybe 13 years old um he got into it there was a long time scout his name was george genovese for the giants so i used to play on the scout league team on sundays and george signed i mean a ton of players from dave kingman george foster um just a lot of major league players throughout the years so and that's how my dad kind of got into scouting so he started as you call a bird dog kind of maybe a half scout but in the area um for the Giants, and then eventually scouted full-time for the Tigers, and he signed a, a few players from the Tigers um, that made it to the major leagues. But, yeah, I had a kind of a hardcore Tiger Woods dad. So put the batting cage in the backyard when I was nine years old and was hitting every day. And, uh, yeah, it's nice to have a, you know, I was an only child, so to have a dad that really knew baseball and, you know, really helped me out throughout my career. In high school, you were an All-American catcher and ended up hitting 30 home runs in your high school career, uh, including a day where you hit four home runs with a solo shot, a two-run homer, a three-run homer, and a grand slam. Could you talk about that moment and what that was like being in the spotlight at such a young age? Yeah, I was never a home run hitter. I don't think I really hit many home runs until my junior year and uh, really my senior year. So. I was a second baseman, a shortstop, uh, really wasn't a catcher. And uh, until I figured out that that was going to be my best position going forward in the long run, um, I just couldn't, I didn't have the speed as a shortstop or second baseman. So it was a perfect transition, especially my dad being a scout, saying that that would be my position going forward to the big leagues. Um, And then, you know, hitting those four home runs in high school was just, you know, one of those lucky days. It was supposed to be a rain out. We weren't supposed to play. And next thing I know, it's, it just turned out to be the solo two run, three run and grand slam in the same game. So it's nice to have that on the back of your rookie card. So everybody always asked me about that day. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. And I'm sure, especially I was reading into it, it seemed like that, uh, that game was one of the ones that kind of propelled your high school to the top of the rankings. Um, Westlake high school, of course, and eventually you were picked third. So that definitely was a big part in the recruiting process, I'm sure. I want to take it behind the dish a little bit. What, in your view, is the most difficult part of catching? Um, well, really working with a pitching staff. I mean, it's about winning and it's about learning how to call games. And, you know, you don't really learn that until you get to the big league level. It's, it's tough in the minor leagues because you're just trying to really produce and get to the next level. But at the higher level, it's about winning. So it's, um, you know, every, uh, I would say every pitcher is a different personality. So you have to really learn to work with all your pitchers differently. They all have a different repertoire of pitches that that you have to work with. Um, So really the easy part is the catching, receiving, and throwing part of the game. So it's really the mental part of the game that, that really grinds on you, especially for 162 games. It's a long season, a lot of ups and downs. Um, and then you got to worry about your hitting side too. So it's, uh, 
really just the mental grind of uh, catching that many games. Uh, you know, all the pitchers have different personalities or different repertoires or things like that. If you had to choose one, who was your favorite pitcher that you had the opportunity to catch? Yeah, we didn't have too many great pitchers. Um, Kurt Schilling was our ace. He was, uh, I would say, he's probably the most fun to catch because he was a strikeout pitcher. Um, it's always nice to throw it down to third base instead of, you know, watching a fielder catch the ball. But it's, um, he was a great pitcher. And um, we had a few. Robert Person was another pitcher who was really good for the Phillies at that time when I was playing. But, you know, Kurt, for all those years, um, I enjoyed catching Randy Wolf just because he was a good friend of mine from California. So I had the opportunity to catch four or five years with Randy. Um, but yeah, Kurt, Kurt was the ace and, uh, you know, I wish we had two or three more of those. Yeah. I'm sure that would have been crucial. Kurt's obviously one of the great ones to ever do it. So that's pretty awesome. Um, so I want to talk about some of the, some bigger moments from your career. Cause you definitely had a few big ones, 1999, especially 1999 seemed like it was your year. You became one of four catchers ever to hit 30 home runs and win a gold glove in the same season. What was something that kind of helped you elevate your game going into 1999 that allowed you to produce at that level? I think I just became just a better hitter. I mean, it was the first year, you know, I hit 300. Um, in 97, I hit, what, 20 home runs, but I only hit 250. Um, I just became just a, a smarter hitter. Um, you know, it was just, you know, when you're hitting for a higher average, of course, you're going to hit balls harder, uh, more consistent. So and that's when I had that big number, the 31. But it was just um, it was just one of those years where I felt like after I hit 31, the next year I could hit 41. Like I really felt that confident with myself in the play. Um, and confidence is very is key throughout playing that many games. Um, and I felt like I was never in a slump that year. Um, it was just one of those years uh, I stayed healthy. I felt strong throughout the year. And uh you know, that's how it happened. And, you know, I wish I can get that feeling back from the rest of my career because it seemed like after that it was a lot of injuries. Yeah. So in 1999, you were selected to participate in Major League Baseball's All Star game. The 1999 edition featured 18 future Hall of Famers. Uh, what was your favorite moment about the Midsummer Classic? And uh, what's that locker room like? Yeah. Number one was in Boston. So, being the you know the history of Boston and Ted Williams I think throughout the first pitch so um that was like the whole group meeting at the middle of the mound and you know meeting Ted Williams shaking his hand that was pretty crazy and there was the Mark McGuire Sammy Sosa so Sosa show also for in batting practice so they launched balls over the monster it was a special batting practice for everyone to watch and then Wound up Pedro Martinez wound up starting the game against us, and I think he struck out like five in a row. So that was like that really silenced our dugout. But it was those. It was just one of those All Star games that was like, I mean, like you said, so many players that are future Hall of Famers or Hall of Famers, or it was just, uh, yeah, that was a special one. Even the year after when I went to Atlanta, it just you know wasn't quite the excitement, obviously, as Boston. I'm uh, I'm curious, what's uh. What's the like competitiveness level like during an all-star game, like from the feeling in the dugout? Yeah. Well, after Pedro struck out five, it became really quiet and very competitive. I mean, everybody's kind of meeting each other, having a good time. And then it was, it was pretty serious. You know, once, once the game started and you knew like, you know, Pedro's out there to win and it, it really mm -hmm. changed the demeanor of the game. Yeah, I mean, Pedro's one of the best to ever do it, so that's pretty special, especially in Boston during his peak, because 1999-2000, he put up two of the greatest pitching seasons ever, so that's fantastic. Um, I want to talk about another big moment. On April 27, 2003, you got the chance to catch Kevin Millwood's no-hitter. Um, you know, going into a game, you always want your pitcher to succeed, but what at what point in the game did you start thinking, like, damn, he's really got a shot to throw a no-hitter here, and were there any superstitions or something you fell or went through during that? Yeah, I mean, it happens in the minor leagues, too. You get to, like, six or seven innings, and, you you know, your pitcher has a no-hitter, and it's always it's almost like a hole-in-one in golf. Like, I don't have a hole-in-one yet, but, you know, I have friends that have, like, seven hole-in-ones. So it's it's kind of like, um, you know, you, you may never get that chance, opportunity, even once in your career to catch a no-hitter. 
and it does get nerve wracking once you get past the seventh inning. But I was just fortunate, lucky enough that Millwood did throw that great game, and uh, at least I have one under my belt. So it was, uh, you know, it was a special day, and I have the memories on uh, on my wall and my in my office that I can always go back on. Uh, so like you mentioned before, in uh, May two thousand one, you uh, tore three major ligaments in your right knee. What uh, what was that process like for you? What what mental you know uh, obstacles were you facing, and what strategies did you take to come back and end up winning a comeback player of the year? Yeah, I think I was like, um, you know, it was the major ACL. I mean, now they're they're probably a little easier than in two thousand one, but um, I think I felt like I started like yoga back then. It was like when yoga was like the very beginning of what yoga was. And the USA Today did this huge article for like a week or two weeks about my off season and how I was, uh, you know, what I was doing for my knee, the things that helped me get back to, you know, the next year. And it was a lot of flexibility and a lot of stretching. And yoga was like, I was taking a class, like I think in my backyard. And this girl was doing like, you know, every day, uh, you know, all the yoga movements and vinyasa. And it was just... uh it was pretty funny because I was always, I always tell my friends, like I started yoga. Yoga was just like, <laughs> no one even knew anything about yoga. And then I hurt my knee in USA Today did this whole, you know, series on yoga and my comeback from the surgery, surgery. But um, I don't wish ACL surgery on anyone because it's always like a nine to 12 month process and it's not fun. But um, yeah, to this day, now I need a, a total reconstruction. I need a, a new uh, play to my knee, they say, because, you know, I can't really go snowboarding or skiing just because of that injury. And uh, I have to remain just on the ellipsical or bikes, probably the only cardio I can probably do. We do a little segment called Seeing Double here as we're double play sports. Uh, is there a player in the game today who you admire his talent because it reminds you of your own? Um, God, I... I wish I had JT's legs um, when I when I played. I mean, the guy can really run, and he's very athletic on the lower side, and he's um, obviously a great catcher. But uh, as far as catchers goes, uh, I love the guy for Arizona. He's a young kid, Moreno, um, super stud behind the plate, and he can hit. Um, rarely do you get catchers that can do both sides. I'll, uh, obviously, Will Smith for the Dodgers is another one who's uh, a really good receiver and he can really hit. So it's, I mean, it's like every year there's really not many catchers that can do both sides. Um, well, and those are kind of the guys that I do admire. And, you know, I, I love JT because he's such a durable catcher and he, he catches, you know, 140 games a year. So, um, yeah, I would say JT would be my number one. So you've made two different appearances on the big screen in the 2001 movie, summer catch. Uh, and in the sports show Arles. Uh, do you have any stories from that set? And what was it like for you, uh, you know, being on set uh, acting? Hmm. Well, yeah, I was one of the few uh, Jewish players in the major leagues at that time. So Arles was obviously an agent and an, an agent for Jewish players as well. So he wanted me when I came into Dodger Stadium to do a little skit in the bullpen. So it was pretty funny having a yarmulke underneath my helmet. And he wanted me to take, it was kind of like the skit was about taking days off, uh, young Kippur and certain days off in, in the major leagues and not playing those days. So that was kind of a funny skit. And then the uh, summer catch one, I, I mean, I've showed my kids, but you have to wait till the credits come up when Freddie Prince Jr. gets called up to the big leagues and he's like, getting the sign from Lieberthal. So it's kind of funny because you have to run through the whole movie before like my little, you know, my showing at the end of the, at, at yeah. the end, so my, my kids kind of get a laugh at that, but um, yeah, I need more. I need more uh, opportunities yeah. for the big screen. Yeah. I would have thought definitely when you were playing in Hollywood for the Dodgers, I thought maybe that would be the, some more yeah. uh, big appearances coming there, but yeah, it's funny. I went back and watched the Summer Catch movie, and there's like a scene at the bar where someone's pitching for the fills, and I'm like, oh, shoot, was that Lieberthal behind the plate? But they never give you a shout-out, and then in the credits, yeah. Yeah, See? I know. Pretty funny. Yeah. But funny how they play that movie all the time, too. On You know, you always yeah. see it, like, somewhere USA Channel, or who knows, you know. 
Yeah, yeah definitely a funny one. And you got to, you know, Cape Cod League's awesome. So it's great that there's a movie that kind of has some of the, you know, maybe not the greatest cinematic masterpiece, but definitely a fun summer watch. Right. Yeah. So another appearance too on screen, and I don't know if this one gets talked about as much, but you're the bobblehead on Dwight's desk in the office. Dwight is rocking the Mike Lieberthal bobblehead. And I've heard all sorts of conspiracy theories about why Mike, you know, you played for Scranton at one point, you got the Michael Scott first and middle name, but have you met any of the guys on the office and do you own a copy of that bobblehead? Visual checks. I mean, it's pretty funny. Like there's one episode where they put, Everything from Dwight's desk, like in a vending machine. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And they're going to the vending machine and there's my bobblehead. Like, yeah. 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 That, but it was like, yeah, just from uh, a Scranton bobblehead, too, which I think I might have one of those. Mm-hmm. Um, but it was funny. Yeah. I wish uh, somebody would have called me and said, hey, do you mind us using uh, your bobblehead? Uh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, but that's pretty funny. I like to show my kids that too. Did you know at all? Like, was it on your radar? No, at all that not until somebody <laughs> told me, like a fan told me, like, hey, did you see the episode of The Office? Your bobbleheads. I'm like, what? <laughs> Didn't know about it. No one told me. <laughs> that's funny. Yeah. I like to meet I like to meet them all. That'd be great. Yeah, <laughs> are you a, are you a Dwight fan? I am. He was hilarious. At least the the fandom goes both ways between you two, right? <laughs> Absolutely. So talk. You talked a little bit about like your sketch on a or your skit on Arliss giving reference to being a Jewish player, but you know there haven't been a ton of Jewish players in the big leagues. There's been some iconic ones in the past. You're definitely on those lists. You're a member of the International Jewish Sports Hall of Fame, a very high honor. What did it mean throughout your career to kind of portray and show your Jewish heritage, and what importance did that bring to you? Yeah, I knew like when I was drafted, um, you know, Philadelphia has a big Jewish community and obviously with Lieberthal and I wasn't from my mother's side, I was from my father's side. So everything was kind of like, well, you're you're not really Jewish unless you're from your mother's side. And then kind of everything changed and they're like, no, well, you're accepted. You're we we take either side We're you're OK. And so uh, from when I went to the big leagues, from Brad Osmus to Sean Green and guys that I knew and played with. Yeah, there was only a few, and obviously there's more now. Um, but, you know, I was just kind of, obviously with that name, Lieberthal, you're always like, everyone, every fan that's Jewish and in Philadelphia is always coming up to you, and, you know, they're excited to meet you, and it's it's, it's actually a pretty cool experience to be part of that. Um, you know, I was never a religious ball player coming up, and, you know, going through... Uh, the major leagues really just, you know, I'm not taking any holidays off. I'm not, you know, not playing. I'm not, not representing like Sean Green, I think did it a couple times, you know, where he, he didn't play on young before, but um, for myself, it was just, you know, being that, you know, that Jewish community doesn't have really many sports athletes to look up to. Um, it was pretty cool to take on that role. And uh you know, to this day, it's, 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 you know, for the players that are still playing in the major leagues, it's, you know, it's pretty cool to represent that community. Absolutely. That's, that's amazing. Yeah. It's always great when there's some mentions of guys. I know Dane, Cra- uh, Dean Kramer on the O's got some shout out and some love. Our next section we're going to do is a fun one we like to do with all of our guests, which is trivia time. Uh, Like we mentioned before, in the 1990 MLB draft, you were the third overall pick. Do you know the two players selected prior to you? Kipper Jones and Tony Clark. Yep. So you were one of three catchers on the 1999 National League All-Star team. You didn't start, but do you remember who started and who the other guy on the bench was? Piazza started. Yep. And, hmm, I want to say Jason Kendall, maybe? Not quite. He was a brewer. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. Who was the other on the bench? Legendary Aussie. Who was it? A legendary Aussie, Dave Nilsson. Oh, my God. Aussie. Yeah. Okay. Right. Yeah. Super funny. And he retired after 99, too. We were just looking into, like, the Dave Nilsson oh, yeah. story. Yeah, he right. retired to... Go back to Australia, and now he's the coach of the national team there, which is pretty great. Oh, okay. Wow, I didn't know that. Last trivia question for you. 
Who was the first pitcher that you caught at the MLB level? The first pitcher that I caught, um, I would say, hmm, I don't know. I think the second pitcher I caught was Fernando Valenzuela, or maybe, uh, um, I don't know. Who was it? Bobby Munoz. Bobby Munoz? No way. I never would have. Ah, I should know that too. Yeah, it's definitely <laughs> a good trivia one to have. That's super funny. Yeah, Bobby Munoz. Great, great one there. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about, you know, you're an iconic, iconic Philadelphia Philly, seen as probably one of the greatest, if not the best, Philly catcher ever. So we want to talk a little bit about Philly. You finished off your career by signing a one-day contract to retire with the Phillies throughout the first pitch at the bank. Can you talk about kind of like the your career wrapping up where it all started and a place so special for you? Yeah, and to open up a new stadium in 2004. Yeah. Um I was able to play three years at the new ballpark. Um, all my years of veteran stadium, really coming up and playing with such great players as Lenny Dykstra and John Crook and Mickey Morandini. And, um, you know, to play with that 93 team, that World Series team, um, to be a part of that team in spring training, at least. I played with four managers, Jim Fergosi, Larry Boa, Charlie Manuel. Yeah. Uh, uh, just like the history of coming from the vet to the new ballpark um, to everything from Chase Utley, playing with Chase Utley, Jimmy Rollins. Um, really, it's about the players you played with uh, throughout your career and the generations of players and um, is what I'll, I'll remember really the most, just being a part of, uh, you know, guys like I met Tug McGraw. Tug McGraw was a big fan. Um you know, just being a part of just the history of the Phillies. Yeah, that's yeah. amazing. You've definitely played with some some legends, some superstars, and Tug's a, you know, we're both Mets fans, so Tug's a icon for us. Yeah, and just to be part of also coming back every year on Alumni Weekend and seeing my friends, you know, being around guys like Mike Schmidt, Greg Luzinski, even the older players, Larry Boa, um, you know, just being part of those generations, those generational gaps. And uh, even though I didn't make the World Series, but I was still part of that, those World Series teams. But the Phillies now in the current day, uh, how do you think uh, their season will go this year? How do you think their teams uh, matching up? How do you – any predictions for their 2024 season? Well, they should make the playoffs considering they're what, – what are they, like top three in payrolls for teams? So they're, they have a lot of great players. They have a great owner. Uh, Middleton, who's willing to pay a lot of money to put the right product on the field. Um, and they do have a core group of players that, uh, you know, between Harper, Rio Muto, uh, getting Trey Turner, having even young players that through the system. Um, it's just, uh, I mean, it's a great group. As you saw last year, I mean, obviously they had a tough time during the season, but once they got in, they had that chance to get to the World Series. Um, I think they're going to have the same chance going in this year, and they should have a, really a much better season than they did last year. I mean, you don't want to be coming in to like barely get into the playoffs like they did last year. So they did struggle a little bit last year with their poor players, but I think this year they're even better. And uh, signing Nola, they have a really good pitching staff. It's just um, it's an exciting time for, to be a Phillies fan. Most definitely. When you uh, were playing, obviously, you didn't get a ton of you didn't get really any of that uh, Philly postseason experience. But did you see the the bank as loud or better in stadium? Too? Did you see that Philly's fandom just at the highest level of uh, excitement? Oh, yeah. I mean, I brought my kids to the World Series and, uh, you know, to feel what it's like to be in that World Series environment is pretty special. So um that was cool for my not only for myself but my family to watch and uh you know going back to the vet it was tough because we went through all those years of not winning so you would have to wait till fireworks night before veteran stadium the how big that stadium is yeah. it's totally packed or maybe opening day there's only there's only a few days where you know you really got that feel but um yeah but now it's uh it's a pretty exciting time like i said for the product that's on the field and uh, the fans that are going to be coming out to watch on a daily basis, really. Yeah, definitely. Mike, that's all we have for you. We really appreciate you coming on. It was great talking with you today. You know, I'm in the Philly area. If you ever stop by or take a trip to the bank, I'd love to 
meet again, but we really appreciate it and hope all is well in California. Yeah, sure. I'll text you when I, you know, maybe alumni weekend when I come in in August. That'd be fantastic. Yeah. yeah you got all right. Awesome. And thank you so much to everyone for listening and uh, have a great one. Yeah. Stay warm.